All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a little past time for us to get started, but uh, we had issues to resolve. So let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we enter your presence this morning with thanksgiving, with joy, with just wonder and, and uh, amazement in our hearts of, for all the things that you do, for all that you bless us with. And Heavenly Father, we just thank you for preserving us and, and keeping us and bringing us to this place gathered together as one body united to do your will. We, we thank you for your word that instructs us and guides us, often corrects us and brings us to, to your truth. And as we consider it and just the simple fact that you gave it and preserved it and did so in a, in a manner that uh, it just makes it all fit together and described by the reality of the world around us in such uh, grand form. It's uh, amazing to us and we, we just uh, praise you and thank you so much for it. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this uh, opportunity we have this morning to open that word, to study, uh, to study it, to, to come to know you through it, uh, and to likewise be uh, encouraged and strengthened by it. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for all of those of this uh, body that are traveling, sick, uh, undergoing uh, difficulties at this time, that keep them separated from uh, the, the body. And we ask that you give us an opportunity to encourage them and strengthen them and once again see those days when they come back in full strength to, to be a, a, a vital part of this, uh, this body of believers. Heavenly Father, all these things we pray in your Son's most holy name. Amen. All right. Uh, one thing I need to take care of first, uh, there were like 15 of these guides printed uh, that were sitting out back that were green. And uh, some of them had, you opened it up to the first lesson, and it only had a paragraph there. If you have one of those books, uh, you have a misprint. I don't know what happened, uh, but uh, if you went through and looked at the subsequent lessons, you realized, hey, I already watched that video. Uh, so... <laughs> uh, here are the new ones. So if you have one of those and you want the new one right now, I'll bring it around. Uh, but uh, if you don't know uh, and you just want to pick one of these up or you want one of these now, I can bring it to you. Just want one? Yeah, the first lesson is about Babel. should be like four pages long. Some of them I, I, I picked them up, uh, I picked them up uh, this coming week or this past week. Yours is good? Yeah, lesson seven. It should be like four pages long. Some of them were printed, it only has one paragraph. Uh, I don't know why that was. Yes. Yeah, it should be quarter two. Some of them were just misprints. Huh? Yeah, they got one. Anyone else need one? Lee? Yeah, because I am. You got an old one, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, Brian, you need one? Okay. Well, I do have extras up here. <clears throat> but chances are, if yours is green on the front, it's the wrong one. Um, so, uh, if it's printed in black and white, it might be right. If it's green, if it's color, it should be that color. Okay. You need one? If it's green, it's wrong. Yeah, if, if it's black and white, you probably have the right one. You're good. That, no, that'll, that'll, it'll be good. All right. So now that I've fixed that faux pas... Uh, we'll go ahead and move on with uh, the lesson. Last week we were talking about Babel. This week we're going to kind of finish up uh, that discussion. Uh, you may recall last week we kind of went into, you know, what, what's this whole story about? Is it just about the, a bunch of people who build a tower because they thought it was a good idea to, uh, you, you know, elevate themselves and God, seeing them lifted in their pride, uh, decided to knock them down a peg uh, and, um, you know, uh, teach them a, a lesson? Uh, is that really all there is to it? Um, well, I think that makes a good, you know, introductory story uh, to Babel. Uh, because certainly pride is part of it. 
uh, and pride is probably going to be the root uh, of the issues here, uh, but that's really not the fullness of the story, is it? Uh, we, we looked at a couple of different things last week <clears throat> that uh, hopefully uh, you've been able to give a little bit more thought to uh, and, and consider, uh, but we looked at a couple things, uh, you know, last week, and I, let me just point out uh, those very, very quickly uh, that kind of tell us that, you know, this story is a little bit larger uh, than that. Uh, it has a little bit more meaning than just some people were filled with pride and God, knock, God knocks them down a couple pegs. Um, first thing that we need to understand is that the story of Babel uh, is designed to be a bridge between the descendants of Noah who came off of the ark uh, and um, <clears throat> had the, the command uh, of God to go forth and multiply uh, and subdue the earth uh, and be all these things that God wanted them to be. Okay, so that's the thing that leads up to Babel. Um, and then right after Babel, uh, we're introduced to a guy by the name of Abram. A guy by the name of Abram, and God <coughs> is having to call him uh, out of the world. God is having to call him out of the world uh, and uh, out of the world primarily, uh, primarily of um, I idols, uh, of false images. So if Babel is the story, <coughs> Babel, <coughs> it'll go away, I promise. <coughs> and know that, <coughs> you know, at home I talk and I do all that. I stood back there and talk to the kids for five minutes. And for some reason I get up here and it doesn't work. Uh, but anyhow, <coughs> anyhow, um, and I throw myself off. Um, Babel, <clears throat> Babel is supposed to be the story that explains how we got from the descendants of Noah coming off of the ark. Uh, and then of course you could even go further, Ham, Shem, Japheth. You could go further and look at how, um, which son is it that looks upon his father's nakedness? You remember that? Ham, right? <clears throat> and because of Ham, uh, what, who, who's going to be cursed? Canaan, right? It's going to be Canaan. Uh, Canaan's going to be cursed, uh, and, um, you know, what's that all about? That, you know, we move forward in time, uh, and what we find uh, is that that cursing and, and um, you, you know, the, the idolatry and, you know, all of that uh, really is explained by uh, Babel. I mean, the picture of Babel takes us from that generation to the generation of Abram, and it is the explanation for how we got from here to here. Now, why is it the explanation? Well, there are a couple of things about it that tell us this is the explanation. Number one, not only do they build a city, not only do they build a city, but they build for themselves a tower. And the specific reason that they build this tower uh, is so that they can, in their own words, make a name for themselves. And as we pointed out last time, what other people were there? I mean, the Bible tells us that all the men of the world were gathered in one place, right? So who was it that they were making a name among? You know, if it's just them, right? If it's just them, then who else is observing them and recognizing their name? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so basically what we have is this picture uh, of humanity uh, operating in the presence of God, uh, and they don't seem really too content with that. Uh, instead, they want to make for themselves a new name. I think is the implied idea. Uh, towers we looked at in ancient times last time, uh, and you can look at all the different references we have in here, but you know, towers, sometimes uh, in the period of the kings, which we were looking at uh, on Wednesday nights, uh, <clears throat> those towers, um, or high places as they were called uh, in that period uh, of the kings, were typically places where uh, they would go to worship. Uh, and it was a place that was designated typically as a worship uh, uh, place of false gods. You remember when, um, you remember when Elijah confronts uh, the prophets uh, of Baal? Where were they? They were on top of a mountain. Why? Well, because that's where the high place was. That's where their place of worship was. Even among the Jews. Uh, even among the Jews, when they decided they were going to build a temple, where did they build it? on the top of Mount Zion. Uh, so, you know, they built, uh, you know, their temple there. Uh, and of course, you know, mountains play a prominent part uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, but, you know, they didn't just build a city. 
So it wasn't a matter of them just being gathered together and united. Uh, and uh, they built a tower. Uh, and this tower had a purpose. And the purpose was to make a name for ourselves. Well, the only beings in existence are them and God. Uh, so, you know, what was it they didn't have? Well, we move forward uh, in the Bible and we find the thing that they didn't have uh, were these false gods. Uh, so, you know, uh, now do we know all this for sure? No, but it seems to fit rather well. Uh, and it seems to explain uh, a lot of uh, different things about what we read in, in the Bible. Now, what we didn't get to is some of the other passages in the Bible that kind of speak to uh, this uh, idea. All right, so let's go, uh, let, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, and um, we're just going to read the first few verses. Well, I... Yeah, I tell you, let's start at verse 7. Uh, and of course, this is what we commonly call the, the Song of Moses. Uh, and in that song, he says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you, um, show you your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most, when the most High <clears throat> gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons uh, of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle, he stirs up his nest. And he goes on and talks about, you know, Jacob. But you'll notice here, one of the things that he says uh, is that uh, he allotted to each of the people. He's the one that divided them. He's the one that divided them all up, and that's talking about Babel. Uh, and that division uh, had God then allotting certain things to different peoples, uh, different peoples. Now, look at Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. <clears throat> And we're going to do 25. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go back to 20, um, 22. In the next generation, your children who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a far land, will say, when they see the afflictions of the land and the sickness with which the Lord has made it sick, the whole land burned out with brimstone and salt, nothing sown and nothing grown, <clears throat> nothing growing, uh, where no plant can sprout and overthrow, uh, like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and, and Zeb, uh, uh, Zeboim, uh, which the Lord uh, overthrew in his anger and wrath, all the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land? What caused the heat uh, of this great, <clears throat> great anger? Then the people will say, it is because they abandoned, uh, abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them, when he brought them out of the land of Egypt and went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, uh, kindled against this land, bringing upon it uh, all the curses uh, written in this book. All right, so you notice a couple of things here. <clears throat> he makes this special covenant with Jacob, right? And he says that, you know, he is their God. Uh, and they are his uh, people. And it's not that God, <clears throat> it's not that God, um, how do you want to put it? Uh, you know, put his stamp of approval on, on the false gods of the people around him. Uh, but it says that, you know, God chose those people. God chose the people of Jacob. That was their allotment. He was, they were his uh, portion. Uh, and they decided to turn their back, you know, on that covenant. But different things were allotted to different peoples, um, you know, throughout the world. Now, that's not right. That's not wrong. I mean, it's not right. Uh, it's certainly uh, wrong because God's going to condemn, uh, you know, all of those false, uh, you know, teachings. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, here, a thing I want you to notice uh, is that there was an allotment. Okay, there was an allotment. There were certain people that were pulled out uh, and made separate. Uh, when this whole, uh, when this whole uh, of humanity was sent forth, um, why were they, you know, what was the thing that defines that nation, defines those nations as they're going forth? Well, it's their false gods. It's their false teaching. Uh, and that all goes back to, I believe, you know, Babel. Uh, and the portion that was, you know, allotted to, a uh, portion that was allotted to uh, Jacob. If you go forward to Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, if you have your notes in front of you, it's just printed right there, you can read it. It said, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere um, to repent. Now, what is he talking about? What are the times of ignorance? I mean, or is that just any time when people just don't know things? Well, let's go forward. Let's go to Acts chapter 17, and let's do a little bit of reading of the context. Acts chapter 17. What's that? It's all right. We'll wait for you. Acts chapter 17. And I, I guess really to, to get the full brunt of it, we, we need to start at 16, but I'm going to read just a couple verses there and then I'm going to skip forward. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, in, at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Okay, so that's the context. That's the stage. He's in Athens. Now, if you know anything about ancient Greece, um, you know that this is something that's to be expected, right? Uh, Greece was a place of idols. It was a place of false gods. It was a place of what we today would call mythology. Uh, mythology. Uh, so, you know, you look around and you see the statuary and all of these temples and places uh, to these false gods. Uh, and, you know, Paul instantly has a sermon idea. Right? So skip forward just a little bit to verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every nation, or excuse me, in every way you are very religious, very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heavens and earth, does not live in temples made uh, by man. Now skip forward just a little bit uh, to verse um, 28. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being, speaking of God. Uh, have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we indeed are his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or, silver or stone or an image formed by uh, the art uh, of, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the art, by the art uh, and imagination of man. These times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So he starts off with, huh, look at all these idols. They need to know about the real God. So he tells them about the real, you know, the true, the only one God. And then he says, look, there, there was a time when men made up these things. When they, with the hand, with the, you know, the skill of their own hands, they formed idols. He even calls it art. Uh, he even says it's imaginative. Uh, but he says it's just simply false. He said, there was a time when, you know, God winked at that type of thing. Now, what does that mean, God winked at it? Overlooked. Overlooked? In what way? I mean, he just kind of, I don't see it, la, 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 la. You know, you know I mean, what? Huh? Okay, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, right? Because it says here, these times of ignorance God winked at, and, and yet Elijah killed 500 prophets of Baal, right? On the orders of God. So, what do you, I mean, he condemned false prophets all over the Old, and false teachers all over the Old Testament. So, I, I don't know, what, we, what do you think?
Okay, yeah, that's probably more to the point here. You know, it's more a matter of, um, it's more a matter of uh, seeing, as Deuteronomy says in 32 and 29, that there's a difference between the person who was the Jew and the person who was not the Jew. Okay? The Jew, the descendants of Jacob, uh, the descendants of Shem and Eber, uh, and however far back you want to go, um, they're the ones that have been educated. They're the ones who have received all along the divine insight. And they have been called to the covenant relationship with God. They're the ones that have, you know, God looked at them and said, I want you to be my people and I will be your God. Uh, everybody else didn't have that type of relationship. They weren't given that type of education. So they remained ignorant. Okay? Now, ignorant here is not, you know, barbaric or uncivilized or, you know, things like that. It's just simple lack of knowledge. Uh, that's what it means. They did not have the knowledge that the Jewish people had. Uh, so they were ignorant uh, of these workings uh, of God and, and, you know, pursued these idols and this false worship. Uh, and I think because of that, uh, that God, um, uh, God does not ultimately uh, hold them in account, you know, for, uh, you know, many of those things. Yes. But I think the main thing here is the allotment, the portion uh, that uh, he's uh, he's addressing because Paul comes along and he says look there was a time when that was okay there was a time when you know when there was a difference between the portion of Jacob and the portion of everybody else but that time's passed uh, that time's gone uh, now all men are called to to repent all men are called under this you know same you know large you know tent of Christianity uh, everybody knows uh, everybody has access uh, it's not a lineage anymore uh, it, it is a uh, choice for every human being you know to make okay. Kimmy Well, not really. I mean, if you live in, for instance, uh, you know, some remote part of communist Russia, I mean, where you, you can't run down to the Christian bookstore and buy yourself a Bible, a Bible, and you're taught your entire life from the time you were this big, not the story of Noah and Jonah and, you know, all of that. You know, you're, you're taught about other things. Uh, and I don't know exactly what they would teach, you know, the importance of the state and the importance of the government and the importance of, you know, this and that and your job and your responsibility to your people and you know I'm sure those are some of the things that they're taught and that's kind of the highest uh, moral um, and uh, you know so in a very physical way they have less access uh, and um, that's it's not just them and then there are other people who for instance in um, predominantly Islamic countries that okay they may have access but your access just might get you killed uh, and um, you know that deters a lot of you know people so I think it's perfectly correct to say that not everybody has the same access um, I think uh, what we need to understand though is that's not God's fault I mean that's humanity and that's the broken nature of who we are well I mean it's
Well, I, I do too, um, kind of. Um, by the same token, we have complete access, and yet we are in spiritual decline. So, I mean, you know, and we see this in, in, in when we go to Mexico too. You know, these are people who are impoverished and don't have much, and you know, all of the things that we have, they just look at and they, you know, they wonder, how can anybody ever have that? And how can anybody ever do this? And, you know, how could you make that much money and come here and do that? And then they find it hard to understand at times why we, you know, do the things that we do uh, and where that money comes from. Um, and yet, they're happy. It, you know, um, I mean, granted, we provide them places where they can have Bible studies and uh, be safe and secure, and, uh, and it's a great work, and, and the church has grown by it um, because that really brings people in, you know, down there. Well, where did this come from? And, what, and they start asking questions. Next thing you know, you, you know, we've got a Bible study and things like that. Uh, so the work, uh, you know, works, but, you know, the people are primarily happy and content um, and, and very religiously inclined. Um, but their government probably doesn't appreciate them having access to that. And if we were going to compare them to us, they're definitely far more limited than we are. You know, just simply by natural resources. Um, so, you know, it, it's, kind of a, it, it's kind of a complex thing to consider who has greater access. And is that greater access on a physical level, um, you know, a benefit? Or is it actually a detriment? You know, because, I mean, again, look, we, we have religion <clears throat> and spirituality has free course, you know, in, in our country. And what has it done? We've created, you know, 3,000 different groups of people who think that they can pretty much approach religion like it's a spiritual buffet. Uh, and half of them don't even appreciate what they have because they only show up on two days out of the year. You know, I know that's generalizing. You know, but, I mean, <clears throat> when you start comparing, you know, that, that's kind of a tricky game to play. <clears throat> but, when she was talking about people, <clears throat> people, um, but basically ignorance today, you, you know, uh, people having the same access to God's word. Uh, and um, I think you're right. I think some people are limited. Um, but, you know, they're limited typically by the evil deeds of men. You, you know, people don't see, and, and this is why, you know, in my, again, you may agree or disagree, and it's going to be kind of a political statement, but this is why the, the, the 60s and 70s are such an abhorrent era, because you have this large group of people embracing this philosophy, um, communism, uh, in our own country uh, that basically wants to get rid of the Bible and spirituality and it doesn't make any sense because it's the thing upon which we were founded it makes our nation great uh, and it's just you know I, I don't I mean it, it just uh, you can look at these other places and you can see they don't have unfettered access um, but that's not I think what Paul, is, what Paul is telling us is from God's angle of things. There's a time when, you know, that type of thing was overlooked. But now everybody's called to the same big tent. Everybody's called. Uh, it's just like Christ said when he was uh, alive. He'd say, I'm the way, the truth, the life. You, you know, that is kind of the precursor to what Paul says here. You know, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Christ. You know, so out of these, and here's the thing I want to drive to, and I, I promise you, Jeannie, I will get to you. Here's the thing, since Kimmy brought it up, uh, that uh, we, we kind of were driving to in the, in the beginning of it, uh, is that from this time of Babel, working our way forward, you know, how many, you know, religious entities have been founded? And how many of them persist today? You know, we have Buddhism, we have Hinduism, we have Islam, we have, you know, and go and name all of these things. Go and name all of these things. These are the things that you know, spring from or stem from this event that occurs all the way back here in the book of Genesis 
Uh, and then God says, you know, look, this is the history of these people, and this was their allotment. You know, Jacob was my allotment, and these people, uh, these people went, went moved forward, and they had this the other allotment. And yet, now's the time uh, when everybody is called to this, to Christianity, to come and be a part of this, you know, uh, the, the plan of God that he had in mind from the beginning. Uh, and that is to not just simply, not just simply uh, you know, create a salvation for a small group of people, uh, but to create a, small, to create a salvation for, um, uh, through that small group of people for the whole of humanity. That's why God tells Abram when he meets him and makes the covenant with him, and you will be a blessing to all nations. It's going to start with you, they're going to continue in their ignorance, but when the plan full comes in into full blossom, it's for everybody. You know, it's for everybody. Uh, and all of humanity is going to be called to it. There's a time of ignorance. And all of these other things over here that people pursued in their past, you know, those are part of that ignorance. Uh, and, um, you know, we may not like that. And people of various world religions might not like that. But then again, they might. You know, think about, you know, well, you know, you're, you're this. You know, this is the way you were raised. And this is the way you were brought up. And, you know, you go to the Bible and you tell them, look, this all started at Babel. And I understand. You know, your culture went and they founded themselves on this language and with this type of people. And you formed this type of religious belief. And then you move forward in time and history and tradition takes over. And you know, for a time, God winked at that. God winked at that. And you do have all of this tradition, but you see, that time is done. That time has passed. Um, you know, you have an explanation for the question, why are there so many religions in the world? You know, so uh, to me, it seems you know, to be a, a fitting explanation and actually a good point to start uh, with, with someone who uh, is of one of these world, you know, religions. Well, where did they come from? You know, when did that form? Uh, so on. Jeannie, you had a question. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> in order to answer that question, you'd have to know, you know, the, the, the population growth of every country and every, you know, I mean, because people are... It, right, but the thing you've got to realize is, and you're right, you can't help what family you're born into. You know, but think of it this way. Take the statement that's made by uh, Paul in, in Luke 17 and, and make it personal. Make it personal. You know, pretend for a moment that he's not talking to a nation of people, but he's talking to you. Right? Because see, when Paul, when Paul spoke to those people, he wasn't speaking to them as a government official giving national policy. He was speaking to them as an audience uh, that was designed to take this message home on an individual basis. So in reality, what Paul is saying to every individual there is that you, in your own personal ignorance, in the past, 
God winked at that. But you see, that time's done. It's time for you to not be ignorant anymore. It's time for you to wake up and start thinking. That's what he's saying. Exactly. You're, you're responsible. Now, uh, the well, you're right. I mean, people are trained a certain way, and, and it is hard to overcome that. But you, you know, uh, people do it all the time. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people. You know, in, in one of the greatest mission fields the the church has seen in the last. 10 to 15 years is India. Uh, and, I mean, you talk about people steeped in ancient religions. Um, it's them. Uh, and yet, in droves. You know, and I've got three, four friends that go to, to India just about every year. And they come back and it's like, how many did you baptize? Well, we only did about 200 this year. And 200. Wow. And then you follow that up with, well, okay, but how many of those are actually still there next year when you come? About 98%. Yeah. And you're like, wow. It's amazing. So, you know, you talk about people who are not only, you know, taught by their parents to believe something. Um, you're, ta you're talking about people who culturally, um, you know, beyond their family, their, their family, their town, their city, their culture, uh, have been fully accepting of a, of a large number of false ideas, uh, and the entirety of the culture uh, is kind of compelling them in a, in a certain direction. See, at least here in, in America, you can do whatever you want. You have the choice. I mean, tomorrow you could become a Baptist. The day after that, you could be a Presbyterian. The day after that, you could put on one of those orange robes and shave your head and walk around, you know, banging your tambourine or whatever you want to do, you, you know. Here, you have unfettered access to whatever. Uh, there, not so much. And yet, they still make the choice. Hundreds of thousands of people every year. You know, so again, go back to Paul's words. He said, the time of this ignorance, God winked at. But that ignorance is done. It, it's over with. Someone else had something to say. Hand up? No? Okay. A couple more passages, uh, and we got, we got like 30 seconds, um, but let's see. Um, if you look at uh, Matthew 3, verse 2, Matthew 4, 17, Matthew 10, 7, uh, Matthew 20, 21, uh, Christ is talking about the, the, the kingdom of God was uh, at hand. Uh, he comes to his fellow Jews that he was rejected by the, the Jews, uh, goes through his ministry as a whole. And again, I'm running right through this because we, we have little time. It goes through his entire ministry. Of course, we know that he's killed. Uh, he's killed. He's placed in a tomb. He raises the third day. Uh, and then 50 days, you know, after all of that, uh, Pentecost comes. He had already told his disciples, Terry, in Jerusalem, until you're dude with power on high. Day of Pentecost comes. What happens? What happens? If Babel is this parenthetical mark, Pentecost is the other one. They are bookmarks of the same idea. Basically, you have men from several different nations gathered in this one place, gathered in this one place. They all start speaking different languages. Sounds a lot like Babel, doesn't it? Uh, sounds a lot like Babel. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, read through the rest of the notes. Uh, and the lesson is yours, guys. I appreciate everybody's comments, input. Next week, uh, and just so everybody knows... Next week, we're going to be watching the video. Every single one of the lessons, uh, even when it's, we don't have a video, is two weeks long, uh, unless otherwise indicated in the notes. So next week, we're going to be watching uh, the video about Noah uh, and the flood and what actually happened, as opposed to some of the things that uh, are currently being taught to, in film and so on. Uh, and then the next week, we discuss. Uh, but even when there's not a video, we still do the same thing. It's two weeks, uh, two weeks per lesson. Okay, so next week we're going to be doing Noah, um, and uh, if you don't have one of these, uh, make sure you come and get it, because it will have uh, the notes in there uh, that, well, you'll need this to take notes uh, as you play the video, all right? That's our time, guys.
You can turn in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 21. John, chapter 21. And I guess you could say that for at least uh, this year, we're going to actually be in a series of lessons. It doesn't come off as a series, I know, many a times, but every once in a while, I like to come back and remind us that at the beginning of the year, for at least the last few years, we've chosen a theme. We've chosen a theme, and you go way back, and you can maybe remember some of those themes, and I, I thought better of trying to give us quizzes about uh, those past themes, but uh, if you remember at least a couple in the past, we, we had uh, the kingdom together. Uh, then one year we talked all about, you know, courage uh, and being courageous. And then this year we're pursuing the theme. We're going after the theme. We're studying the theme, life, joy, and the pursuit of God. And we're in that section of our study that talks about life. What does it mean to have life? What does it mean to live? What does it mean to live fully? What does it mean to embrace the life that God has given us? And we've said so far that if we're truly going to be joyous people, if we're truly going to have that joy that we can have in this world that is beyond what men can typically measure, then we are going to have to pursue God. And when we pursue Him, seeking that joy that He offers, then we are truly alive. But we realize that the road to being truly spiritually alive the road that is the opposite of what Paul would describe when he would encourage men to awake. You who sleep. You who are dead kind of inside spiritually. And it's not really an indictment. It's an encouragement. Paul realizes that people will be in that state. Then he says, look, you don't want to be sleeping. You don't want to be the guy that, that's got the pillow and he's napping. When it comes to these spiritual things, wake up. Wake up and, and live. Be alive. See, if we're truly going to be alive, then we can't be asleep. We've, we've got to move forward and we've got to, to grow. And we realize that this road, this life, this path, this what Paul calls walk, is not necessarily the easiest of things. On a practical level, it's fairly simple to understand exactly what we mean by being alive in Christ. When you go to the book of Colossians, Paul writes there about being alive in Christ. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, he would say. But you've been made alive in Christ. In other words, you can have that salvation that, that Christ is, is offering. And, and sometimes we really, really make that simple when we say things like, you know, if you hear his word and if you believe and you repent of your sins and you confess the name of Christ and you're baptized for remission of sins and rise to walk in all faithfulness, then you're alive. And on a simple look at the paper in which those words are written sort of view of things, it is really quite easy, Right? It's a basic understanding of Scripture. And yet, you and I both know that Jesus Christ himself, when he talked about this sort of thing, he said, the gate is narrow and the way is straight. It's difficult to navigate. It's not always going to be the easy path. I guess the precursor to this is some of the stories that we read about in like the Old Testament. For instance, the road from favored son to Pharaoh's second for Joseph. Pretty easy journey, right? No, not really. It, it, unless you want to include, you know, brothers all want to kill me. Brothers throwing me in the pit. Then brothers recanting and deciding, huh, I'll just sell him to slavery. And then false accusations and tossed in a prison. I mean, unless all of that counts as, man, party time then no, it's not easy. We understand that. Now this morning we want to talk about one of those difficulties that we sometimes have when we are pursuing this course. When we are on the pathway of what we call life, or life as spiritual beings. I don't know why that says John. Did I say John 12? Yes, yeah, Iman says that too. It should be 21. This morning we want to talk about one of those things. Now I'm not a gigantic fan, nor do I have their entire repertoire, but you ever heard of a group called the Bee Gees? Kind of a 60s, 70s type group, I guess, you know? I mean, uh, the Gibb brothers, tragic stories, most of them. All died relatively young. Well, there might, I don't know if all of them died, but many of them died at very young ages. 
But they have this song, and it kind of reminded me of this lesson when I started putting it together. It says, I started a joke. You know that song? It says, I started a joke that started the whole world crying. And I thought about that song as I thought about this lesson because today we're going to talk about regrets. We want to talk about things that get in our way from living spiritually. And one of those things, and really it's just us. I mean, it's just you getting in your way. But regret is a big, big thing. So let's begin with this question. You ever done anything wrong that you look back on? Maybe, maybe you've done something so wrong that even today, as you're thinking about that wrong, it causes you to kind of cringe on the inside. It makes you want to kind of repel the idea as quickly as you can because it makes you that uncomfortable. Maybe it was living in a lie for a long period of time and then you were found out and then you had to face up to the consequences and you regretted it all along. Maybe it was, you know, you, you cheated on something or you cheated on someone. I don't know what it might be, but most of us live with some kind of regret because we all mess up and do bad things. Now, the reason I thought of that song is because it reminded me of one of the things that I did. Literally started a joke that started, well, not the whole world, but started a whole group of people down a wrong, wrong road. See, I had this friend. His name was Steve. And Steve was the kind of guy, well, I worked with Steve, and Steve was also a friend at school, but Steve was one of those guys that knew everything. Now, I'm not talking about one of those guys that actually knows everything, but he's one of those guys that knew everything. And everything that he knew was something that you didn't know, and if you did know it, he knew it better. You know the kind of guy I'm talking about? The kind of guy that when you talk to him, it, it's just this constant frustration because he's constantly trying to, you know, one-up you. You have this unique experience, and you come back, and you're like, man, I went and I did this, and, da, 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 and you come to find out that he did it too. And his experience was not only just like yours, but his was better. It was an amazing thing. So one day, we just got particularly annoyed with Steve. And on that same day, Steve forgot the keys to his car at a register. Bad thing to do. See, because Ed and one of his friends, well, anyhow. But anyway, we took the keys. We made copies of the keys. We set the keys back on the register. And then for about the next six months, we played with Steve's mind. It started at work. We would take Steve's car and we would move it a couple spots over. And then a couple spots over turned into a couple aisles over. And then from this parking lot, the employee parking lot, to the public parking lot. Pretty soon his car ended up one time across the street in a lawyer's parking lot where some of the people from our workplace parked. After a while, it turned into Friday Night Ventures when Steve wasn't at work. But Steve would go to the mall with his girlfriend and we would find his car there and move it a couple of spots. And then we would move it a couple of rows. And then eventually, Steve found his car on the other side of the mall. And we never did harm to the car. We just moved it a little bit. And it drove Steve crazy. And he would come to us wondering, how's this happening? What's going on? He never suspected us the whole time. And then one particular day, Steve got really particularly annoying. So we got a couple of hydraulic jacks. <laughs> and you can pretty much stop there and just know it's going downhill from this point. We got a couple of hydraulic jacks and we jacked his car up. And on each, behind each one of the wheels, we took jack stands. And we put them on the axles so that the car set high enough so that when you tried to move, the wheels would just spin. But it was low enough so that you couldn't really tell the car was off the ground. And at midnight, he came out of work, got in his car, started it up, and went to take off, and he just sat there. It's okay to laugh. It was funny. That's what we did, 17-year-old. But it started something else. 
started something else that went down a path that just got increasingly worse and worse and worse. And you end up with consequences that you can't quite deal with. At first it was a joke, and then it turned into something worse. I see at the end of the day it's a car, it's stuff, and that's the way we saw it. But it wasn't our stuff, and we shouldn't have messed with it in the first place. But there are greater, far worse things to mess with. And it's some of those things that we do that we deeply regret. It's some of those things, some of those fouls, some of those breaks of faith, some of those lax, lapses in holding to what is right and true and good that make far more far greater, I guess, a difference in who we are as people. See, some folks come in and they say things like, well, you know, that's the past. You just need to kind of get over that. You know, you do those kind of things when, you know, you're young. And I'm not talking just about the car thing. You know, the other things too. Well, you did that and it's in the past. You just need to get over it. You need to move on. How often has that advice helped anybody out? It's kind of like stating the obvious. Well, you did this, nothing you can do about it, so you might as well just forget about it. That's not going to happen. So you might as well not even tell somebody that. It's absolutely pointless advice. And it's not advice that we can go to the Bible and say, well, you see right here, Christ just said, get over it. See, Christ just said, when you're having trouble, just press on. Find that passage in the Bible for me where Christ ever said that to anybody. It's not there. You're not going to find it. People don't say that when they want to actually help you. People say that when they don't know what to tell you to do. Other people come along and they say, well, as long as you're just good from now on. Yeah, you've got these regrets and yeah, you've got these things in your past, but just be good from now on. And that good eventually is going to reach a certain height and weight and depth that it's going to outweigh all those things you did in your past. Again, where's that in the Bible? Where does that ever pan out in life? It doesn't. You can take a tire and bury it in the ground. You ever, you ever see this? You can take a tire and bury it in the ground. It's old, it's decayed, it, it, it's got the, you know, the tread wore off. Take it to your backyard, you bury it. You know that tire will find its way back to the surface. I, I don't know how. I don't know why, but for some reason, they do. Your regrets and your troubles are the same way. You can put as much dirt of good works on top of it as you want to, but it's still going to come to the surface. You're still going to have to deal with it. So this morning, we just asked the simple question, how did Christ deal with these types of things? Well, the first thing we have to acknowledge is that Christ dealt with people who had these types of things in their life. We're going to talk about one. We're probably going to talk about one that is in the hands of the probably uh, most ministered to, most talked about, uh, probably more care given to disciple that Christ had, a fellow by the name of Peter. Now, we know Peter is this impetuous man who does a lot of things that just seem to be off the cuff and sort of outrageous at times. And we kind of expect that from, you know, Peter. So sometimes when that comes along, it's almost as if we sort of dismiss it. Well, that's just Peter. As if that's an excuse for things. But you see, Peter was part of that inner circle. Christ had his 12, but then there were certain of those disciples that always went a little bit further. There were some that went to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. Same group went to the Garden of Gethsemane with him, and the rest stayed back here, but these went ahead with him. So Christ had devoted a lot of time to Peter and these other men in this inner circle. Had taught them, had brought them along, had mentored them, had shown them many, many things. And we know the story. 
just before Christ is going to die. He lets his disciples know, this is what's going to happen to your master. We're going to have to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to have to suffer much at the hands of the elders and the, you know, the, the Pharisees. And I'm going to die. And he's going to say a whole bunch of things about that death. And one of the things that he says is that, you, you know, I'm going to triumph over the grave. The gates of hell or the gates of the grave are not going to overcome the building of the kingdom of God, he would say. But you remember Peter's response when he tells him that he has to go to Jerusalem and he has to be persecuted. Peter's going to stand up and he's going to tell Christ. He's going to tell him, look, I, I promise you. That I will remain faithful. And he even looks to the other men in the circle and he says, These guys all might fail you. One of these guys over here might betray you. They may run away. They may be scared. They may be all of these things, but I'm none of those things. I will remain faithful. I will go with you. And I will enter into prison and even death for you. That's what Peter says. Does Peter live up to that promise? No, Peter does not live up to that promise. He doesn't excel to even his own words. And Peter is a man... Once he fails and once the cock crows and once he realizes he has betrayed the Son of God. Just as Christ had predicted, the Bible tells us that he remembered what Christ said. You go back to Luke 22 and you can read the actual words. He remembers what Christ said and how Christ had spoken to him about this very moment. Promise made, promise failed. He remembers, he betrays Christ, he remembers the words, and then the Bible tells us that he went out bitterly and wept. Here's a man who has regret in his heart. Here's the moment in which that regret comes to him. I did it. I can't undo it. I can't go back. I can't change the past, but I still have to deal with what I've done. So from that moment on, what happens? Well, we're going to fast forward just a little bit, and I want us to observe three things. And this is where John chapter 21 is going to come in. And it's where we learn about how Christ deals with regret. See, sometimes when we want to deal with regret, we, we listen to other people. Well, just forget about it. We just do good things. Or sometimes we just simply listen to ourselves. Well, you know, if I just don't expose myself to it, if I isolate myself, if I pull into my shell and I don't have to expose myself to it and don't think about it, then it just all goes away. So we become kind of what? Self-centered, self-focused, and all of that, putting so much energy into avoiding the thing that we know is going to come back to bite us anyhow. And we end up not solving the problem. When in the beginning, we, just sh we should have just simply asked the question, what would Christ do? How does he deal with regret? John 21. It's a section of scripture that we know and we know fairly well. Christ has risen from the grave. He has come back. He's already appeared to his disciples. They already know that, you know, he is uh, alive and here. They're out fishing. And Christ is going to appear to them again. And most of us remember this story because they're fishing, they catch nothing. Christ tells them, put down your net on the other side. They catch the great draft of fish and they end up eating breakfast with Christ on the beach that he has made for them. And then the section that we remember best after that is where he talks to Peter and he asks Peter that three times, do you love me? And each one of the times he tells him, you know, you need to feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. But in reality, 
what's going on here is that Christ is coming to these disciples to help them deal with the things that are going on, mostly in their heart, but certainly situationally. The first thing that I want us to notice is, number one, what does Christ do with regret? He confronts it because it is reality. He confronts the reality of the situation that we find ourselves in. Notice verses 1 through 4, chapter 21. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. Is this just a story about a guy who wants to know if they caught any fish? A better question is this. Why do you think they were out there fishing in the first place? I mean, weren't these the disciples of Christ? Weren't they told that they were going to be the witnesses of Christ all over the place? Aren't these the guys that supposedly are going to go into the world and they're going to teach the world about this whole Christian thing or being a follower of Christ? They're going to be the ones that proclaim the kingdom? So why are we out here fishing? Well, if you know anything about these guys, you realize they were fishermen to begin with. And when we say fishermen, we don't mean that they kind of did it on the side as, you know, a hobby or occasionally. In their prior life, this is what they did professionally. This is what they did to make money, and apparently they were very good at it and had made a very good living for themselves. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. And a lot of people have surmised that perhaps what Peter is saying is, I'm going back. Going back to that old life. Going back to to the thing that I'm comfortable with. I'm going back to that place where I know I can do something and do it well. Because I've messed up the other things. You see, he's seen Christ. He knows he's risen from the dead. But apparently they've not had this conversation yet about what Peter had done. Peter betrayed Christ. And all of the other disciples, they had fled. They ran away. So no doubt Peter feels this regret and he says, I'm going fishing. I mean, Christ is risen. And one of the, <laughs> the greatest miracle of all time has just occurred and your master the guy that you spent the last three years with is at the center of it and yet there's no excitement here there's no let's go tell the good news here there's a let's go back to the old way let's go back to the place that's Comfortable. How did that work out for Peter? Well, not very well, apparently. Christ yells out to him and says, Do you have any fish? You remember what they said? No. (laughs) We don't have any fish. We're the professionals. We're going back to this way, where it's comfortable, where it's safe, where we know we know what we're doing, and apparently... They don't, at least on this night, because they've caught nothing. Can you imagine that? I mean, imagine yourself, you know, you you put yourself out there and you go and you pursue a course and realize you can't do it. So you go back to the things that you did before that. You, You get a job and you realize, I can't do that job. I just don't have that skill or I can't think on that particular level. And you go to go back to the job that you were working before and now you find that you've lost that skill too? Now what? Can't help but think that God is kind of whittling down the options for Peter here. Peter, what are you going to do with that regret? 
What are you going to do, Peter, with that rock that's sitting in your heart because you betrayed the Son of God? Yeah, you can run back to that place that's comfortable for you and where you think you're competent, but I'm going to take that away too. Because see, that's just it, Peter. You're running. You're running away from it. Christ comes along and says, you have to confront the reality. Peter comes to the beach, and what does he do? He begins this conversation with him. And that conversation has everything to do with what Peter had going on in his heart. Do you love me, Peter? See, that's the heart of the question for Peter, isn't it? You proclaimed your, proclaimed your love for me before. You said you'd never betrayed me. You say you will always be faithful to me. So Christ doesn't have this big conversation with him with all different shades of meaning. He just comes right out and states the question, Do you love me, Peter? See, if we're ever going to overcome regret, we have to deal with regret. We have to deal with the reality of the situation that typically we have created for ourselves. We can't run to the safe place. We can't hide it. We can't bury it. We can't simply build enough things on top of it so that we don't have to address it anymore. We have to confront the reality of it. But see, that's not enough, and that's not really the whole of what we're saying here. What we're saying is that you have to confront the reality of it in light of Christ and his sacrifice. As broken as you are, Christ died for you. So we have to confront. Next thing. He counts the blessing. Counts the blessing. Or maybe if you want to put it a different way, he grants them blessing. They have no fish. Christ comes along and he says, let me show you the way. You need to put your nets down on the other side. You need to take those and go to this place. And that's where you'll find your answer. See, after they say no, he opens up to them a new world of possibilities. Now, what are the odds that just on the other side of their boat all night long is where the fish were? And not a single person on that boat thought, huh, maybe we ought to go to the other side. They fished all night long off the same side of the boat. You really think this is about sides of the boat? I doubt it. It's about Christ, and it's about the blessings that he offered. See, even though we are in sin, even though we are seeking resolution for that sin, even though we have troubles and struggles and all of those things sometimes weighing on our heart, Christ is there and he's ready to bless us. He's ready to open up worlds of possibility for us if we'll simply let him in. So that he can help us transform and transition to something far, far greater. See, I think that's probably what James meant when James in chapter 1, verse 5. James in chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And then right there at the end, he, said, he basically says, God's not going to criticize you for that. He's not going to ridicule you for that. He's not going to say, how dumb are you? He's going to give you all of that wisdom. See, when we don't know, he provides the answer. When we are struggling, he comes along and blesses. Now, typically what we call this is just very simply grace. It's not that you deserve any of it. It's not that, you know, you mounded up enough good things that, you know, okay, we're good to go. Christ comes along, sees you in that struggle, and he is willing to. To bless. Turn over to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, <clears throat> beginning with verse 16. Romans 5, verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of the one of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following condemnation, but 
<clears throat> following many trans, excuse me, trespasses brought justification. For because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more, all those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, there's the sin, there's the regret. So, one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. There's the cross. There's the grace. There's the forgiveness. There's the solution to our problem. Christ is willing to bless if we're willing to let him bless. If we're willing to allow him to transform us. Hey, yesterday we went with about five, what, seven people, Philip? And we cooked at the Ronald McDonald House downtown. It's for families that have kids who are being treated at uh, Children's Hospital there. And Bethany and I walked in and we were the first ones there. And we were greeted at the door by some smiling faces who showed us around the place. And on their counter there, they had this jar. And Bethany was looking at the jar and she wondered what was in the jar. And the, and the lady just invited her to take one. And she pulled out a couple things from this jar and, and read them. And I want to read one of those to you today. Simple little pieces of paper folded up that look like this. We pulled this one out, and these are just for people who visit or the residents there. And you'll have to notice that there's all kind of little drawings on this. Somebody made these up and placed them there for people to take. And it poses this question. It says, how does one become a butterfly? And then it gives the answer. You must want to fly so much that you're willing to give up being a caterpillar. Do we want to be a child of God so much that we're willing to give up all of that heaviness, all of that hardness, all of that difficulty that is bound up in our heart? See, sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes we just become bitter and resentful. And somewhere along the way, we just kind of learn to like the pain. And we forgot how to laugh and enjoy life. And see it for what it is, a blessing of God. Somewhere along the way, we, we've lost our bearing. And we've transformed, but it's not been into anything good. And it's because we've never dealt with those things that have taken up residency in our hearts that have now embittered us and caused us problems. See, just like James, just like Paul and Romans, we've got to come to the cross and we've got to find that blessing. And then finally, we've got to receive the comfort that only Christ can give. Is it lined like that? Yeah. No idea why it's doing that. We've got to receive the comfort that only Christ can give. Christ says, feed my sheep. Now, something I want you to notice about this. Sometimes we focus in on the whole idea of the question that Christ is asking Peter. And folks are pretty quick to point out that when he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? That the third, do you love me, is a different word for love. And that's true. And it's almost as if Christ is saying, well... If you can't love me this much, then you need to at least love me this much. And that's all kind of debatable depending on interpretation. But there is one thing that's said every time that you can't dismiss. And that I think is the point that sometimes we miss. Every time Christ says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And essentially says to Peter, Peter? There's still place for you in all of this. You may fail in your love for me. And you may have to grow back forward and get to that point where you love me to the point where you're willing to lay down your life. And that's the Peter we see after Pentecost. That may be you years from now. It's not you now. But regardless, Peter, there's still place for you. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. There's still a place. 
And that ought to be comforting to us. It ought to speak to our hearts and say that whatever regret I have, whatever weight I have, whatever I've done in my past, I can let go of it. I can overcome it. I can get rid of it, give it to God, and let him dismiss it. Now, maybe this morning you're here and you have some of that heaviness weighing upon you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never taken the opportunity to become a child of God. Well, maybe you know his word and maybe, maybe based upon that word you, you understand the concept of, of faith. Let that faith take hold of you this morning. And let the strength of that conviction lead you into repentance and lead you to confessing Christ and lead you into the waters of baptism so you can rise to walk in the newness of life. Maybe you just simply need to let go of some things with the help of Christ as he blesses you and comforts you and lets you know with full assurance you can let it go. If you're here this morning and subject to the invitation's call in any way, we urge you to come as we stand and sing.